Je m'appelle David Malone. Good day. Uh, my name is David Malone. I have the pleasure to be the president of IDRC. As uh, you may have seen, there is simultaneous interpretation. But for your questions, if you'd rather ask them in French, please go ahead. I will translate if necessary. So you're welcome to speak French in this session. My name is David Malone. I have the privilege of uh, being the president of uh, the International Development Research Center. And today we have a terrific uh, guest, Dr. Rima Khalaf Hunedi, uh, who uh, together with her colleagues in the Arab Bureau of the United Nations uh, Development Program, nearly 10 years ago, uh, made a tremendous difference and started a conversation in the Arab world and beyond that simply hadn't occurred before uh, through publication of the Arab Human Development Report in 2002. There have been subsequent iterations of uh, the report, but that was the one that broke the barrier, so to speak. Its publication was strongly resisted, it's important to remember. It was resisted internally by some within the UN system. It was also resisted by a number of delegations, Arab delegations. And between Dr. Khalaf, um, the head of UNDP, Mark Malik Brown, who was later a cabinet minister in Britain, and, of course, Kofi Annan, there was a determination to see this important document published, and it was. Uh, Dr. Uh, Khalaf was very well placed to be the uh, game changer uh, in UNDP on this issue. Uh, she is a graduate of the fabled American University in Beirut, but she also has a PhD in systems research from a leading university in the United States. In her own country, Jordan, at a remarkably young age, uh, she was appointed uh, Minister of Trade and Industry, later Minister of Planning, ultimately Deputy Prime Minister, uh, all of this over a seven or eight year period in the 1990s. And then uh, she came to New York to the UNDP. In recent years, she's been exceptionally busy being honored, uh, but also sitting on a number of boards, launching a new foundation uh, in the Arab world, the Maktoum Foundation, and uh, sharing her reflections on the Arab world, the wider world, uh, with audiences uh, like ours. So, Rima, you're no stranger to IDRC, but it's uh, a great privilege to have you with us as one of the spe featured speakers in our 40th anniversary series. Um, we were keen on having uh, exceptional individuals from various parts of the world that IDRC works in uh, on topics that are of wider relevance to the development sphere, um, as your topic certainly is. So the podium now is yours. A warm welcome. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, David, for your uh, introductory remarks and for inviting me to participate in uh, your speakers of Renan series. It really is a pleasure to join you in celebrating the 40th anniversary of IDRC. I'm sure it's a source of pride and great satisfaction for you to look back at four decades of um, support for research communities in the developing world and see the lasting impact that your interventions have made. Uh, I also congratulate you on the model that you have adopted, which empowers local researchers, and uh, I wish you continued success. Um, let me uh, go to, uh, to the topic of Arab human development. Uh, development in Arab states has been the subject of uh, volumes of works by scholars in East and West. Most of the commentaries, however, approach the subject from an, a purely economic perspective. As countries of the region strained to belong to a globalized world, their me measure of success became their competitiveness index and their macroeconomic stability. Unfortunately, human development and human security fell through the, the cracks. In my remarks today, I will try to bring human beings back to the center. 
I shall start with an appraisal of how Arabs fared over the past decades from a human development perspective. And then I would like to conclude with an assessment of the role of Western governments and how they can enhance their impact on well-being in our region. Uh, a cursory look at the development scorecard shows many achievements for Arab states over the past three decades. According to the uh, Human Development Index, none of the Arab states fall in the low human development category, though two, Somalia and Iraq, could not be classified. Arabs are now more educated, and in the majority of countries, they lead longer and uh, healthier lives. Some statistics, adult illiteracy rates have dropped to 28% high, but a great improvement knowing that it was 40% just a decade earlier. School enrollment rates have increased to 83% for primary education and 59% for secondary education. Female literacy in particular expanded threefold since the early 70s and female primary and secondary enrollment doubled. 8.8% of Arabs are now connected to the internet and we have more telephone subscribers per 1,000 people than an average developing country. Health indicators show similar progress. An average Arab is now expected to live 67 years, as opposed to just uh, 50 in uh, the mid-70s. Infant mortality was slashed by two-thirds, and under five mort mortality dropped by 70% uh, over the last three decades. Arabs are doing better than the average developing country on many of the uh, MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, including child immunization, and access to improved sanitation and safe water. Our people have the second lowest ratio of undernourished children among developing regions and the lowest recorded homicide and assault rate in the whole world. Such worthy achievements, however, should not blind us to what the numbers fail to measure. How empowering can internet access be if a civil servant decides for you which sites you can access? Should a woman in Darfur have been thrilled with the 10-year increase in her life expectancy when she was under constant threat of being forcibly displaced or violated? And how comforting should the low rate of conventional crime be to those who lost lives or loved ones to the machine guns of occupiers or the explosive devices of terrorists. Human development isn't just about education, health, and income. It's about people leading meaningful and productive lives. It's about their ability to choose and achieve the things they value in life. It is about freedom, freedom from fear, and freedom from hunger. And it's about human dignity and human security. Probably this is where Arab states have achieved the least. Today, Arabs enjoy less freedom than most peoples of the world. In most Arab countries, uh, freedoms of expression and association are suppressed and at best restricted. Civil society organizations are under siege and few parliaments are truly representative or independent. Ours is a region where the essential attributes of open societies, such as respect for human rights, accountability of the executive authority, an unfettered press, truly independent courts, and free and fair elections are still elusive. It's a region where citizens are still subjects, where people are yet to have a say in decisions affecting their lives, and where the peaceful transfer of power is still the exception, not the rule. This state of unfreedoms in our region had its toll on human development and well-being. The democracy deficit is negatively affecting economic structures and their ability to yield meaningful increases in standards of living, even in monetary terms. Without proper representation, priorities for the allocation of public funds become the prerogative of the ruler or the elite. Ostentation trumps people's needs as revenues are spent on luxuries that the average person would neither opt for nor benefit from. As a result, the efficiency of investment deteriorates. Between 1975 and 98, Arab states spent on average 25% of their income on gross fixed capital formation, that is investment. Yet, Arab countries are less industrialized today than four decades ago. 
Had such huge outlays been equitably planned and efficiently expended, they could have taken Arab states a long way towards combating the two dangerously rising problems of unemployment and poverty. In the 1980s, the weighted average of unemployment in six Arab states, uh, comprising about 57% of the Arab labor force, was 10.6%. That's in 1980. 20 years and trillions of invested dollars later, this average has risen to 15.5%, and this is pre-financial crisis. The youth and women are the hardest hit. According to a 2008 uh, study by the League of Arab States and UNDP, 50 million new jobs will have to be created by the year 2020 in order to provide jobs for new entrants as well as for the currently unemployed. Poverty is also increasing despite economic reform programs and the highly publicized government's efforts to combat it. In 2005, the percentage of people living below the lowest national poverty line reached 18.4% in nine non-oil exporting countries. The figure is more alarming for less developed countries as one in three suffers from abject poverty. The absence of democratic governance has also had its toll on innovation and the region's ability to compete in a global economy. Lack of transparency and accountability inevitably leads to corruption. This diminishes the incentives to innovate and to improve production processes. Why spend resources on enhancing efficiency if the way to a government contract is access to power rather than a better product? As competitive pressures disappear, innovation and modernization become marginal. In such economic structures, both progress and equity are sacrificed. And though income poverty could be somewhat contained, particularly in richer Arab countries, the Arab world became afflicted with a different and more excruciating type of poverty, that of capabilities and of opportunities. And human deprivation took a more alarming form, that of voicelessness, powerlessness, and exclusion. The impact of failed governance extended beyond the economic to the societal. Injustice and marginalization have led some of our societies to fall apart. Civil wars and ethnic and sectarian strifes have already erupted in Somalia, Sudan, Iraq, and Yemen, while the potential is not non-existent in other countries. Some point fingers at regional and global powers for exploiting stress points in the region's mosaic, and they do. But one cannot ignore the effect of flawed systems of governance that erode the concept of citizenship and hence push people to bunker behind the tribe or sect. Most of the quasi-civil wars we are witnessing these days did not originally start as ethnic or sectarian struggles. They started as wars against the unfair distribution of power or resources. This applies to Saada and southern Yemen as much as it applies to Darfur or South Sudan. Regimes could have easily nipped such insurrections in the bud by a more equitable allocation of resources. But they opted for a military solution. And to mobilize their people for war, they ended up polarizing their societies. As a result of regional instability, 47% of today's 16 million global refugees are Arabs. Over half of them are the 4.5 million Palestinians driven out of their homes in 1948 when Israel was established, while the others, mainly Iraqis, are victims of more recent conflicts. This is not counting the close to 10 million internally displaced people who, along with refugees, are subjected to the most humiliating of life experiences as they lose homes, roots, livelihoods, and sometimes life itself. To conclude the assessment part of my remarks today, I would say Arabs managed to varying degrees to free their people from hunger, but not from fear. They somewhat succeeded in building their people's capabilities, but failed to provide them with the opportunities to utilize them. They enriched some, but marginalized many. But as we Arabs plead guilty to not doing enough to improve the lives of our people, we cannot proclaim others innocent. 
This is particularly the case when it comes to foreign occupations and inequitable global governance systems. The Israeli occupation of Palestinian and Arab territories, an historical anomaly seen nowhere else in our post-colonial world, continues to deprive Palestinians of their inalienable rights under international law. Collectively, Palestinians have been denied their right to freedom and self-determination. Individually, they have lost homes, lands, and lives to a colonial settler that treats them as lesser human beings. Under Israeli occupation, Palestinians incessantly suffer from what the former speaker of the Israeli Knesset, Avraham Berg, describes as, quote, injustice, abuse, and worst of all, contempt for Arab life, end of quote. Only in the occupied Palestinian territories does one see remnants of the much condemned segregation of the last century. Despite repeated demands by Palestinians and Israeli human rights organizations, official Israeli policy continues to prohibit access to public resources to people based on their ethnic or national identity. A most flagrant example of such policies is the huge network of roads built on lands expropriated from the Palestinians but designated for the exclusive use of Jewish settlers, roads that no Christian or Muslim Palestinian can use or tread. Israeli families, Les families have also had ont aussi souffert au plan physique et émotif lorsqu'il y a eu un cycle de violence dans le pays et de contre-violence. Un autre exemple négatif d'environnement externe qui émane de l'échec de la gouvernance mondiale d'appliquer et de veiller à l'application du droit international. Le fait que l'occupation israélienne en est à son... No one disputed the illegality of the occupation or of Jewish colonization of Palestinian lands, save, of course, for some fanatics who believe that they are in command of a divine promise that naturally trumps international law. Yet the lack of adequate and timely action by the custodians of global peace and, and security encouraged Israel to expand its settlement activities with near impunity to the detriment of regional peace. When peaceful channels to resolve disputes are blocked, people resort to all other means at their disposal to defend their rights. Though the struggle against foreign occupation is leg legitimate under international law, actions by others cross the line into new domains that put at risk human security in the region and beyond. Violent extremists today threaten not only the lives of our people and their security, but also they are determined to reverse the clock on reform and modernization at home and trigger a wall of civilizations with the rest of the world. Yet extremism is not exclusive to any one religion or to Arabs and Muslims. When Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, former Shefardi, Sephardi chief rabbi of Israel, addressed the devastation wrought by Hurricane Katrina, he blamed none other than the victims themselves for their suffering. Quote, over there, there are Negroes. Do Negroes study the Torah, he asked. Let's give them a tsunami, sink them, end of quote. And when Rabbi Chen addressed Israeli soldiers before their assault on Gaza, he assured them that theirs was a battle between, quote, the children of light and the children of darkness, end of quote. His worldview is not exactly as at odds with bin Laden's believers versus infidels. Violent extremism has become a threat to humanity at large. A first step towards combating it would be for each of us to see and address fanaticism within our own societies. So far, most of us manage to see only the extremist other. Ladies and gentlemen, I need a glass of water. Uh, going back to Arab human development, uh, human development in our region cannot be achieved under status quo conditions. Reform is necessary, desirable, and indeed overdue. But reform cannot, as in the past, be limited to economic reforms and structural adjustments, which miser miserably fail to bear fruit in the absence of good governance. Achieving higher levels of human development necessitates rebuilding 
political systems on the basis of popular participation and the full respect of rights and freedoms. This would require developing all democratic institutions from a transparent and accountable executive authority to a fair, efficient, and independent judiciary. Partial reforms cannot be an option. Upholding the rule of law will not be of much help if the law itself is not fair, protective of rights and freedoms, and applies to all. And legal or constitutional reforms could result in further marginalization of weaker segments of the population in the absence of real public participation. Reform efforts should also be inclusive of all segments of societies, including the state, civil society, and the private sector. They could benefit from the technical and political support of regional and international institutions. Western countries can also play a role if support strategies are constructively designed and if there is a political will to do so. Uh, currently, the unofficial West is helping the cause of reform in Arab states through two very important channels global NGOs and Western think tanks. NGOs, particularly those concerned with human rights, are bringing to light many of the violations of human rights in our region. Advances in information technology helps in the almost instant dissemination of such information. Thanks to NGOs like Human Rights Watch, Reporters Without Borders, or Transparency, Transparency International, illegal detentions, torture in prisons, violence against demonstrators, disappearing journalists, or corrupted officials are no more just the subject of rumors or the material of banned and sourceless, sourceless communiques. They are documented facts. By bringing abuses to the public domain, NGOs provide not only information, but also protection, limited as it may be, to reformers and human rights activists. By knowing that they will not rot away in prison without anybody ever noticing, activists are energized and emboldened in their pursuits. Think tanks, on the other hand, complement the work of NGOs through their research and public education programs. One example of such think tanks is the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, which provides specific policy analysis on both the Arab-Israeli conflict and political reform and democratization in Arab states. With a center in Beirut, it has the added advantage of being continuously and deeply informed by knowledge and views from the region. Its Arab Reform Bulletin, published regularly in both Arabic and English, explores and analyzes issues affecting reform and provides actionable policy recommendations that have the potential of affecting decision making in the region and in many Western capitals. What about the official West? Uh, does it have an interest in supporting democracy in Arab states, and what can it do? First, supporting good governance and democracy in Arab states <coughs> is definitely more consistent with Western values, principles, and ideals than consolidating despotism. But foreign policy is not just about values. It's about interests. And here the view is rather hazy. Though few politicians would speak publicly against supporting good governance in Arab states, democracy in the Middle East is seen by its opponents as a potential threat to three Western strategic goals, regional stability, free flow of oil, and the security of Israel. In addition, opponents argue that supporting democracy in our region may backfire as it undermines important regional allies whose cooperation in security matters is crucial. Others ask, what if democratic processes bring the likes of Hamas, Hezbollah, or the Muslim Brothers to power? Now, I take issue with some of these arguments. First, the argument that democracy may undermine stability is problematic for me. It assumes that the region is stable as is, and that there is an inherent contradiction between stability and good governance. Neither argument can be substantiated. In the short term, a quick assessment of current regional dynamics would show that the state of equilibrium we seem to be enjoying is inherently unstable. In the medium to long term, stability would be safeguarded, not undermined by good governance. Second is the issue of Israel. It is presumed that democracy in Arab states will run contrary to Western interest in protecting the security of Israel and in procuring the cooperation of Arab regimes in this respect. 
Whether there is an element of truth here depends on how one defines the security of Israel. If it means protecting the continuation of expansionist and colonialist policies, then most probably the hypothesis is correct. No Arab government representing the will of the people would be able to play along or justify normalization with Israel as long as the occupation of Palestinian and Arab territories continues. However, if the conflict is resolved according to international legitimacy and to the satisfaction of both, democratic Arab regimes are definitely more capable of guaranteeing the security of their own peoples as well as that of Israel and of protecting the new regional order than despotic ones. Third is the issue of oil. The contradiction with Western interest was real during the Cold War or when the issue was concession agreements that did not take the interests of the people into consideration. But this is no longer the case. The issue now is more related to the free flow of oil at reasonable prices. Such interests can be more protected by regional stability than by undemocratic governments. Fourth, on regional allies. It is true that Arab regimes are playing an important role through their security cooperation with Western powers. However, they are able to play this role because they are not bound by respect for international treaties and universal human rights. They may be able to provide their Western partners with valuable information through torture and inhumane treatment of detainees. But these oppressive methods, which may or may not lead to the arrest or killing of terror suspects, will in the process create hundreds more as it causes further anger and alienation. Needless to say, in the medium term, democratic regimes are more capable of combating violent extremism than despotic ones. By the mere fact that they would represent the will of the people, democratically elected regimes create the motivation for society as a whole to defend its stability and fight those who threaten their democratic choices. Lastly, the issue of who will win the elections if held. With public frustrations running high as a result of abuses at the hands of occupying powers and repressive regimes, the risks from a Western perspective of Islamist parties winning a majority or a significant minority in fair and transparent elections are real. Anger will lead some voters to opt for leaders who are seen as clean, uncompromised, and willing to challenge their oppressors. They will vote for the Hezbollahs and the Hamases of the Arab world. Four reasons in particular give such parties the edge over others. The first is there currently are no others. Regimes have uh, uh, suppressed dissent and blocked the formation of opposi opposition political parties for a very long period. The three other re reasons include their anti-occupation stand their, and their support for Palestinians in their struggle for freedom and statehood, their network for social services that reaches the most marginalized, and their image as neither corrupt nor corruptible. Only a real democracy can level the playing field and allow other political entities to emerge and successfully compete for people's votes. To conclude this assessment, democracy in Arab states will not come without its risks to others. Most of those risks will be mitigated or will disappear if the Arab-Israeli conflict is fairly resolved. Such risks, however, should not lead one to believe that supporting the status quo is necessarily a better alternative, for the status quo is not sustainable. Despite repression, or most probably because of it, the momentum for change continues to build up. Ultimately, transformations will happen. In democratic societies, this takes place at the ballot boxes. But where the real public, part, real public participation does not exist, change will come through the streets. It can take many different forms, including revolutions, military coups, civil disobedience, or even civil wars. Under such circumstances, the outcome will not necessarily be democratic governance, and the process may be far away from peaceful. If such a scenario is to play out, it becomes in everybody's interest, including Arab rulers and Western allies, to increase the chances of a democratic outcome and of a peaceful rather than a violent process towards it. So what can the rest of the world do? If 
despite the risks, the official West decides to support democratic transformations in the Arab world, it can do this through a balanced utilization of both tools of foreign policy, financial aid and bilateral diplomacy. A number of bilateral donors are already using financial aid to fund activities like training women candidates for parliament or training judges uh, and journalists. Such activities will have little impact in the absence of a serious political will to reform on the part of the regimes. The benefits of training women candidates will rem remain of limited value when elections are rigged. And training judges will not yield a better and fairer judicial system as long as the system itself is not independent and the laws are not in line with universally endorsed human rights. To be effective, financial aid has to be complemented by a diplomatic drive that incentivizes current regimes to introduce political reform in well-studied, gradual, but meaningful steps. Resistance from regimes is to be expected, but faulty design can also trigger resistance from reformers themselves. Much can be learned in this respect from the launch and demise of the Greater Middle East Initiative that was to be submitted by the U.S. to its G8 partners at the Sea Island Summit in May of 2004. The initiative faced a tsunami of rejection from officials and reformers in the region and was dro dropped less than two months after it was leaked to an Arabic newspaper. Now, looking at the activities that the initiative was supposed to support, one would find it difficult to explain the brutal reaction that it generated. Building on the diagnosis of the first Arab Human Development Report, the initiative identified three priority areas for G8 support, promoting democracy and good governance, building knowledge societies, and expanding economic opportunities. But when it limited the scope of misdeeds it was going to address to those perpetrated by Arab regimes and failed to address the violations to Palestinian and Arab human rights by Israel, it magically unified the otherwise two warring parties, Arab reformers and Arab governments, in its opposition and denunciation. The most important lessons that can be learned from the saga of the Greater Middle East Initiative and the reform experience of the last decade are, one, all abuses of rights should be delegitimized. No oppressor, friend or foe should be granted a waiver. Target, targeting violations by, by Arab regimes while acquiescing to those perpetrated by Israel will render the motives of any initiative questionable. Two, Western initiatives should be seen as supportive of a homegrown reform agenda rather than an imposition of a foreign one. Three, the governing principle should be the upholding of international values and rights, not exporting Western ones. No one would like to be told that their values are inferior to those of others. Four, supporting reforms and democratic transformation in Arab countries should be seen as a goal in and of itself rather than as a means to achieve another goal like fighting extremism, though it's expected to lead to that. Five, for an effort to be credible, it's always advisable to start supporting democratic change in countries ruled by allies. It looks disingenuous and insincere when mainly opponents are bashed for their violation of human rights. Six, I have only seven, so one more to go. Democratic outcomes should be accepted by all as long as they respect human rights, protect freedoms, and safeguard popular participation ensuring both majority rule and minority rights. And seven, the process itself must be inclusive to succeed. To conclude, whether Western governments will support an Arab transition towards democratic governance will ultimately depend on how they assess the impact of such a transformation on their interests in the region. The verdict currently seems to fall in a gray area. Some will support democratization as something more in line with their values and principles, regardless of the few glitches it may generate. Others will be more swayed by the risks and will rationalize their support awaiting better days. For those, only after resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict will the risks be mitigated enough for all to come on board the political reform train. 
Regardless of such positions or those of Arab rulers, resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict should not become a prerequisite for political reform in Arab states. One acknowledges, though, that ending the conflict would certainly make the transition to democracy an easier task. It will deprive regimes of their pretext for not reforming. It would restore stability and take away a strong element in the mass appeal of extremists who consistently exploit the resonance of Palestine with the Arab street. It would free Arab reformers to forge international partnerships for change, and it would liberate the West from its fear of th authentic democracy in the Arab world. Despite such enormous benefits to reform, resolving the conflict should not be pursued by the international community just because of them. The occupation should end because it is legally inadmissible and morally indefensible. The conflict should be resolved because it has caused unimaginable human suffering for both Arabs and Israelis. Once this is done, one unintended yet much welcome output would be this convergence of interests around reform and democracy in our region, around a system of good governance that will protect the peace and bring about more secure, meaningful, and dignified lives to all. Thank you very much. Rima, thank you very much. Uh, would you prefer to stand? It may be easier for most of the audience to see you if you don't I, mind standing. I, I, because otherwise those um, to my uh, left will uh, not be able to see you. Uh, this session is being streamed uh, live as well as eventually it will appear on our website uh, as a podcast. Um, I see that we have a question being streamed in, so perhaps we can start with it. But for those here in the live audience, uh, we have two microphones. If you have a remark for Rima or a question for Rima, please go to one of the two microphones and when I'm able to get to you, identify yourself and say whatever is on your mind. But uh, why don't we start with this uh, streamed uh, question, which is, uh, are civil society organizations in Arab countries able to use your reports to bring about social and economic changes? in Arab countries, and what has been their success? Uh, yes, actually, I, I, I can uh, comfortably say that civil society organizations were uh, the ones who used the report the most. Uh, and uh, I mean, if you consider the media as part of civil society, the media used it very well, extensively to, uh, one, highlight abuses and violations of rights, two, to rally support for reform in Arab states, uh, and uh, three, to, to um, empower themselves with arguments and information in order to defend the case for reform. Uh, actually, new, or new civil societies or new organizations were formed af after the report was launched in order to uh, support the different issues that the reform raises. Now, some of them were political and uh, argued the case for political reform. But there were other organizations that dedicated themselves to certain aspects uh, or certain problems that were highlighted for the report, for the, in the reports. One example is translation. The first report uh, um, actually highlighted the fact that uh, we have translated so very few books that we are risking delinking with the rest of the world. I mean, uh, and translation has to go both ways. Uh, a number of uh, uh, new uh, organizations were founded, some official and some were unofficial, and I'm, I'm very happy to say some were even funded uh, uh, through um, international organizations and aid, and they're actually producing very, very good books uh, for the translation. Uh, our reports also empowered publishers' unions uh, in order to defend uh, their, their freedom of expression, and their, uh, it helped uh, um, authors whose books were banned or censored. So it, it really uh, probably hit it the best with civil society organizations, old and new, and sort of empowered them. Great. Thank you. Sir? Uh, my name is uh, Bob Ode. Like you, I'm an AUB graduate. And I think we were in a AUB at the same time a few years back. Uh, my question is this. Uh, given the uh, tremendous financial flaws to the various Arab countries from Western donors and more from Arab donors like the Kuwait Fund, Saudi Fund, Islamic Bank, OPEC Fund, 
still uh, these financial flaws seems to be uh, uh, will have only an effect if the rule of law and good governance are promoted and there, uh, there is more effort to fight corruption. I didn't hear uh, corruption at all. Probably I mentioned it once, but uh, okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, uh, uh, the issue here is partly corruption, but partly the inability of people to have a say on wo where those funds go. I mean, in, in real democracies, uh, aid would be much more effective because people have this say. Uh, you, you, you leave it to people to determine what their priorities are. Uh, in, yes, there has been uh, a huge flow of funds to Arab countries, some were bilateral aid from other uh, regional partners and some international aid. But the uh, selection of priorities on where to, to, to invest was not done, I would say, in a most e efficient mm -hmm. uh, way because of the lack of public participation. Um, there, there was also, uh, and I know this is becoming an ideological matter, there was uh, this development paradigm that people were discussing, and this whole issue of the Washington Consensus. Does the state have a role or doesn't the state have a role in, in promoting development? Now, I personally believe that the state should have a role. I'm not saying that the, uh, that the private sector doesn't. On the contrary, the private sector ha has to be the engine for growth. But still, the state has a role in providing social services, in regulation, uh, in infrastructural projects. So uh, at a certain point in time, I would say between 1990 until probably, or mid-80s until 2000, uh, the state uh, uh, started retreating from the provision of social services, which made the adjustment for the poorer segments of the, of, of the population much more difficult and painful. So it's both. A follow-up remark, if I may. What can Canada do more, especially CEDA, being a former CEDA officer? What can CEDA, Canadian International Development Agency, do more in the Arab world, in your view, to promote the, uh, the key uh, growth factors you mentioned? In, in, this is a case where I cannot really uh, uh, give a general statement about all Arab countries because the situation differs between a country like Yemen and a country like Jordan or Morocco and, and Egypt. Uh, but I would say that uh, uh, probably for, for CEDA, for Canada, and for many of the Western governments, I would say that aid is a very important instrument. It shouldn't be the only instrument, but it's an important instrument. We're globalized nowadays, and whatever happens in the rest of the world will ultimately affect other countries. Yes, Canada is far away, more distant. It's not Europe where uh, the African shores are, are, are nearby. But, but as, as you can see, uh, the lack of development has a very serious and negative impact on human security and hence on stability. And those problems usually tend to spill over. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Uh, uh, my name is Andrew Huberts. Uh, there is considerable interest in the political participation by women in the Arab world. And I can hardly imagine a person more qualified than you to comment on that. I wonder whether you have any observations on the younger generation of women and how they're entering political, uh, participate, uh, political activity, uh, the modalities, organizations, NGOs, be it uh, uh, the kinds of political parties. What are the mechanisms? Yeah, uh, well, um, uh, to start with, there, there are really very serious mis misconceptions about uh, Arab women. I know uh, from your question you don't have those misconceptions, but I feel since it's being asked, maybe I have to correct them. Uh, Arab women are really very dynamic, and uh, despite the fact that uh, they were discriminated against in, uh, in the past, this didn't happen in the field of education. I mean, they, they were discriminated against in the labor force and in politics, but at the same time, everybody felt that women should be educated. So you find that their participation in uh, the educational system, the percentage is high. And enrollment rates for women exceed that of men in many of the universities of our region. Uh, when it came to the, to the labor market, uh, we had like societal disincentives. An employer would prefer to hire a man rather than a woman. And although they would, be, uh, they would have the same uh, qualifications. In politics, it was even more difficult. But in the past 10 years, the uh, women have been participating more in politics, and more of the younger generation uh, are, are uh, coming to assume 
uh, for, uh, further responsibilities. You will see the most dramatic change in Gulf countries where I mean, the participation of women in politics was unheard of. Uh, now, you will find a woman minister at the cabinet level in all countries. Even in Saudi Arabia, a woman was recently appointed as a deputy minister, which means, uh, uh, which is a breakthrough, uh, to say the least. They're participating in local councils, in um, uh, all sorts of institu institutions, universities, university presidents. So there has been a very serious breakthrough, which I think is very comforting. As for the younger generation, I think they're, they're more dynamic than my generation, and they're much more promising. I mean, they're, uh, they're starting with a less biased society. I mean, we had to fight our way through because of many societal biases. Things are a little bit changing. Now, I cannot categorically say it's better because at the same time that some societal are, 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 so forces are changing to the better, we are seeing some pullback from the emergence of some extremists in our region who uh, see a distorted role for, for women in societies. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. My name is Suzanne Tamas. I represent the Baha'i community of Canada. I was very happy to read in one of the um, Arab Human Development reports uh, in the discussion of freedoms and their link to human development, acknowledgement of the freedom of religion or belief with all that that entails the right to have, to change, not to have a religion, the right to manifest individually or in community. And it's easy to understand why that link would be there, because belief has the potential to motivate and to release the tra transformative process that needs to happen at the individual and collective level, structural level, so that we can have the kind of society that you're pointing to. And I just wondered, when I read that report, how, how was that section of it received? And have you seen changes or steps taken to discuss further the importance of understanding and implementing freedom of religion or belief in our search for human development? Um, well, that section, uh, I think the call uh, that, that that report made to respect the freedoms and uh, uh, identity of all groups in a society uh, was well received. Uh, the, the way we saw this happening is equal citizenship. So everybody took that part that we want to fight for citizenship rights for each and every one of us, regardless of our beliefs, of our gender, of our sect, and this is how they, they mobilized around uh, uh, this. Now whether there were uh, positive changes I mean, in Iraq, the change has been negative, I would say. I mean, uh, I'm, uh, I think it's, it's not just me. Everybody is uh, really upset about targeting some of the minorities in the country through violent acts. Uh, in other countries, uh, so, so it differs. In other countries, it's, it's better. I mean, um, Jordan just passed a new uh, election law that maintained certain quotas for uh, Christians and so, so, so it's varied. It's uh, it's not consistent across the region. But the only thing that comforts me is that now there is more awareness mm -hmm. of the rights of everybody under uh, a unified law. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, my name is uh, Omar Huash. I am consultant. Uh, you said that there is a, a huge number of uh, uh, refugees in the borders. <clears throat> they are not accepted by Arab world, and also they are rejected by uh, West. Uh, do you suggest a solution for that, or do you have any uh, comment about this, how to, to solve or how to solution this problem? Well, refugees have uh, rights under international law. I mean, some refugees can't go back uh, uh, to their countries like the Palestinians, uh, because uh, international law is not enforced and uh, a solution is not found. But others, like the Iraqis, they can't go back home because of the security situation in Iraq. So the only way uh, to sort the problem of, of refugees, and I have to add, we have many displaced people. It's not only refugees that cross borders. You have displaced people within uh, uh, countries themselves. 
is, is to seriously work on resolving conflicts in the region. Thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, I think we have another question here. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Emily Bishop. I work with IDRC. I'd just like for you to expand on your point. I think it was four of seven in terms of um, international support and the paradigm of um, international reform and support um, not being a means to fight extremism. And uh, I, if I can just ask how you think well, that is an improved approach. Uh, well, uh, my, my comment referred to uh, the freedom agenda that was launched uh, uh, during the, Bu the Bush administration. And the idea, I mean, if, if you just look at what uh, uh, was called for, it's very good. I mean, uh, they wanted people to have freedom and, and democracy all over the world. But actually, the way it was presented, that it was part of the war on terror. And uh, uh, usually this is an unstarter. You, you pursue uh, or, or you support rights because they are rights. It's not because you want to, fought, to fight somebody else. And uh, there was skepticism in the region. I mean, there are many other uh, mistakes. And, uh, but, but that was the point that I was trying to make. I mean, that is supporting uh, freedom and democracy has to emanate from one's respect for universal human rights. Please, sir. Okay. Thank you. I would also like to express our thanks for your coming to Canada to talk to us. Uh, my name is Robert Russell, and um, I, have, I would just like your comments about perhaps the cooperative sector, which has been so important for uh, development in uh, Canada and in Quebec, whether it's for farmers, for forestry workers, uh, credit unions, or something as important as Desjardins. We um, well, visited friends and family in Ramallah and in Amman, and during our trip stopped into the to visit uh, the Kalandia refugee camp, where, to my surprise, there was a small cooperative producing sandals. Um, and I uh, had a chance to talk to the fellow who was running the cooperative, who had an interesting comments about cooperatives. But my question, my simple uh, question to you is, do, does the cooperative sector, or cooperatives as a way of increasing democratic governance or democratic participation, um, are they part of um, something that you see in the in, in the Arab countries? We, we were very surprised to see a cooperative in Kalandia. No, I think uh, uh, I think they do play a role and they have a potential. Although I I personally, I mean, your example is is a very good one. Uh, I really like the uh, what you said about the cooperative in uh, the refugee camp, and I think, but but most at least the ones I know about, more most of their work is uh, more social than political. Mm. So they still, they're still, I don't, they're still not active in the political arena to push for uh, uh, po the political reform that uh, uh, I was talking about. But their role is equally important because not everything is politics. I mean, this is, I'm focusing on politics because it's the area with the biggest deficit. But there are other areas where the cooperative sector is playing a very important role, I agree. Okay. Rima, uh, a question from me. Actually, we were talking about this a bit earlier. Uh, relates to very profound changes, in a way, in media in the Arab world with the introduction, I think it was probably about 10 to 12 years ago, of Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, with reach across the Arab world. When I was fortunate enough to be living in your country 25 years ago, uh, half of the radios were tuned to the Arabic service of the BBC or some non-Arab network for a bit of variety in the news. And I wanted to ask you to comment on this phenomenon now that uh, uh, pan-Arab, which are now global also, networks exist. I think it's, uh, uh, it, 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 it was extremely important for Arabs to have the opportunity to watch different TVs with different points of view. I mean, we were limited to the official TV. You just hear what the Minister of Information wants you to know. And that's why people would go to the BBC or uh, to all sorts of, uh, of media in order to get information. Information was lacking, analysis was lacking, and there was, there was only one point of view. And this was catastrophic. Now, when Al Jazeera came out, it presented 
the uh, another point of view, it entertained uh, lots of guests from uh, the extreme left to the extreme right, and we people there felt that uh, uh, they are for the first time enjoying this right to know. And uh, frankly, I was in the United States when uh, uh, two wars happened: the Afghanistan War and the uh, uh, occupation of Iraq. And I used to watch Al Jazeera and uh, uh, American networks. They were two different wars. I mean, what I saw on Al Jazeera was completely different. And I, I, I even, I mean, I, was, I felt I was much more informed because others just saw one point of view, which was similar across many networks, while I had the opportunity to see more than one point of view, which was very important because I know what Al Jazeera is showing because you see it. But I also know what the others are showing, and uh, uh, I felt that we had better ability to assess uh, uh, the problem itself and to form our own positions regarding events taking place. So it's, it, it's, uh, I think it's a great achievement. I'm not saying that I agree with everything on Al Jazeera or Al Arabiya, and one shouldn't. I mean, you don't watch TV just because you like what they're saying. You watch TV to know what, what others are saying and to know the facts, and they provided this rare opportunity. Thanks so much. I see there are two more questions, uh, perhaps three, and then I think we're going to call it a halt. Uh, Emma, I think you were first, in fact. Um, thank you, Dr. Halef. I'd like to uh, follow up on and your you point. Are? I'm sorry, my name is Emma Naughton. I'm with IDRC. Uh, I'd like to follow up on your point about uh, the international community needing to support a homegrown agenda for political reform. And I'd like to ask your opinion on the role of um, public opinion polling. Mm -hmm. in Arab states. What are some of the potentials of public opinion of polling to try to get sort of the order, the needs and perceptions of ordinary citizens into policy making uh, processes in Arab states and what are some of the obstacles that are currently in place uh, to using public opinion polling in the political reform process right now? Thank you. Um, I'll tell you from my experience. Uh, when uh, we uh, were uh, working on the report, we decided to conduct a public opinion poll in most Arab states. I think we succeeded in doing it in five only. So it's not a very easy job. I mean, you can just go around and ask people what they think of. It's, it's really a difficult issue. And uh, in some countries, we had uh, difficulty uh, even selling our report or distributing it, uh, though it had the UNDP emblem, which means that. So, so it's, it's sometimes the absence of freedom wouldn't even allow you to do that. That's why uh, you, in many of those polls, even by international organizations, they will tell you in uh, five countries, presumably representing the mood in Arab countries, and most probably they will be quoting and conducting polls in the same countries. So it's not that easy. I wish uh, that more could be done because uh, the limited polls we conducted were extremely revealing. It allowed us to tell what people's priorities are. and. Uh, uh, after that, uh, we could speak uh, with whatever certainty polls can give you about what people want, what are uh, uh, their priorities. And uh, uh, I wish, as I said, I, I wish we could have it uh, more often and in more Arab countries, but unfortunately, so far, it's a little bit limited. So we have to rely on columnists, on caucus groups, on uh, 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 opinions that people express uh, uh, over the media or uh, uh, in what they call political salons, where people just meet and say whatever is on their minds. Thank you. Andrew? Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew Robinson. I'm a retired uh, member of the Canadian Foreign Service, and I spent uh, much of my career dealing with the Middle East, including uh, when I had the honor to represent Canada as ambassador to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Uh, I want to just say, first of all, uh, Dr. Halaf, uh, how much I uh, appreciated your remarks today, which I found both thoughtful and thought-provoking. And I congratulate you. I also want to congratulate the IDRC for their initiative in bringing you here. I think this is a very uh, good contribution to public discussion in Canada. Um, and if I may, I'd just like to make uh, one little comment and ask for a clarification. I was struck by uh, when you were speaking about uh, the role of Western governments in promoting uh, democracy and uh, good governance uh, in, um, in the Arab world, you, uh, 
you made a very telling point, which was that uh, promoting, uh, uh, working with civil society and promoting the rule of law by training judges and uh, uh, promoting uh, accountability was not enough uh, if it was if it did not include an agenda by the Western governments to support democracy. Uh, you know, in the countries and, and democratic change in the countries concerned. Uh, but I just hope that that, because I don't think sometimes that is not possible for Western governments for a variety of reasons. But I hope that you are not suggesting that in the absence of a strong commitment to intervene directly in the political process in a country that the promotion of, of democracy and human rights and, and uh, women's uh, uh, engagement uh, is, uh, is not uh, useful because my own experience uh, is in fact that even without, uh, even without ideal circumstances, uh, action in support of civil society, in support of, uh, of uh, uh, voter uh, education and participation, in support of the rule of law, uh, can have uh, significant uh, impacts uh, in ways that maybe aren't always uh, expected. Could I ask you to comment on yes. that, please? Uh, Thank you. No, I didn't mean that such activities should not be carried out or supported. What I'm saying uh, is they will continue to have limited value if, other if they are not complemented by other activities. I mean, I gave examples of uh, uh, where women were trained. Now, the fact w women running for parliament were trained. Now. This is a plus. Whether they win or lose, they have acquired uh, uh, skills and capabilities that they will benefit from throughout their lives, in the next elections or whatever. But if the elections are not fair, and if the results, if the elections are rigged, you, women may, may not end up winning the elections, even if they're the best trained in the world, if they're doing exactly the right thing, if people actually vote for them. So what I'm saying is, this is good, but it has a limited impact. We, you, it needs to be complemented by other means. And by other means, I'm not saying that uh, uh, actually uh, there should be military interventions to reform uh, uh, governments in, in the Middle East or, or anywhere else. No, this is not useful. All I'm saying is what, what Western governments will have to do is just uh, uh, practice what they preach, uh, be true to their own values. If there is something bad, condemn it. Don't associate yourself with it. If, uh, if this person or this country violates law, you just say that it violates law. It doesn't mean that that's the end of your relationship with that country. But that's the only way to reform behavior. If, if, if your feedback, if the feedback of Western governments is always complementary, then there will be no incentive for regimes to, to change. Uh, I, I don't mean regi regime change. I mean the f for, for things to develop. And uh, this is what we want. And this, what I'm saying is, unlike uh, reformers in Eastern Europe, where the whole world was supporting them, reformers in Arab states, nobody supports them. I mean, it's, I mean, whenever there are abuses, very few speak out in support of uh, 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 civil society or in uh, human rights activists. Sometimes it, hap it's, it happens. So what I'm saying is it needs to be complemented. Uh, I'm not saying that those activities should stop. On the contrary, I'm, I, I wouldn't want them to stop because I'm hoping that such skills will be used soon. Uh, uh, we may have an, a, a real fair election uh, in the near future. I hope so. Please, sir. Um, hi, um, my name's Kai Hung, and I'm a fourth year undergrad at the U of Ottawa here. And, um, and thank you very much for being here. Um, it's a pleasure to listen to your talk. So I have two questions that I want to bring f forward, right? And the first one is um, about demography. Because I know the Middle East is a region where there's a large uh, youth bulge, and I think that's a that's a plus and also a danger as well, because you, me you mentioned that there's a lot of investment going into education, but at the same time, there is no opportunities. So I think that is actually quite, quite important, because that is going to lead to a lot of these, these extremist routes, where there's no more options than plan B, C, or E. So what can the governments do 
in the Middle East and for us in Canada do to actually improve those opportunities for the youth because those are the future and that's a very big portion of the population. And my second question is um, relating to governance and um, and towards because like from what I've seen is um, in the Middle East there's a lot of internal resistance from the elites. They don't want to change. Um, for example, in, in, in Saudi Arabia, there's, it's, it's basically there's um, demo, demographic reform is very hard to come by. So I'm actually more concerned about pluralistic views. Is it possible to promote that first be, before having um, democratic sorry, views? Democratic reform, I think. Um, and, and pluralistic thinking, because um, my friend from one of the le leading universities in Saudi Arabia actually told me that um, in their classroom, they actually teach bigotry, that they are actually saying this group of people are worth more than that group. And then that group of pe people are usually linked to the elites of some party in that country. So what are your comments on those two? Well, on, uh, on demography, um, I agree with you. I mean, the solution is more opportunities. Now, what to do, how, how to provide opportunities. The problem with opportunities is that there is no equitable access and fair access to opportunities. Uh, one of the problems is corruption. Uh, one of the problem is marginalization. One of the problem, uh, problems is social biases. So we have to deal with all this in order to make uh, uh, people access all opportunities that is available. One way to generate, this, this has to do with the distribution of uh, the benefits of opportunities. The other is to increase opportunities, and this will, uh, will have to come by through economic reforms uh, that expand the productive base rather than redistribute the benefits among the society itself. Uh, as for uh, resistance, yes, there is resistance from, from the elites, and the elites differ between one country and the other. I mean, uh, uh, in uh, some countries, it's mainly the uh, religious elites. In others, uh, they're the wealthy elites, or the, uh, in yet others will be the cliques around the ruler. In, in some countries, it's the uh, tribe uh, to, uh, from which the ruler comes. So uh, uh, there, there is resistance, and uh, uh, it's expected. Now, uh, uh, the whole objective, the whole idea is political, of political reform is to go from the limited circle of the tribe to the nation to become citizens. And that's why we're focusing on citizenship rights. That's the way, that's the thing that we need to get. Now, how do we get there? I go back to political reform and political, w with all the tenets, including popular participation, where no one individual has a veto or the final say on any matter. People will have to decide. Rima, thank you uh, very much. One thing that's so striking in listening to you, and it's right, of course, uh, is the importance of the West in the uh, Arab world in the Middle East. Uh, having been living not so long ago in Asia, that's a region where the West isn't very important anymore. Uh, it's largely preoccupied with itself and other things. Countries like Brazil are both Western and yet no longer preoccupied particularly with uh, the United States or Europe. So I think it's a challenge to all of us, your talk, to think about you know, how the Western influence can be more positive, but also how it might be less in the future. Because the regions in which uh, the Western influence is less often seem somehow happier because their <laughs> unhappinesses, their unhappinesses have homegrown uh, reasons more than reasons that come from uh, elsewhere. So in so many ways your presentation was extremely thought-provoking. I think everybody in the room, everybody online will have appreciated it enormously. And it gives us a great deal to think about as individuals and as members of our own communities here in days and weeks to come. So May thank I just you comment so much. Before, before, before you take my microphone yes. away. Uh, on, on that issue of the West, the thing is 
that the West is not interfering neither negatively or positively in other regions of the world. Mm. In our part of the world, it has been hindering democratization. It has been supporting despotism. It has been associating with violations of rights in our region. So what, what I'm hoping for is if we cannot change this role into the support of democracy, at least let's uh, uh, reduce the damage as much as possible, reduce support for despotism, and let us live. This is, this is the point that I'm trying to make. And thank you very much. Thank you.